uh, okay, let's see how this works. Yeah, there it is. So there's my thank you, and um, I was going to read it. It's a little hard from this angle, but I can see it. I want to thank Acta Biomaterialia. Um, oh, there's the thank you. And for the generous, very generous gold medal award, it comes with $10,000. It's very generous, very special. And uh, the Society for Biomaterials, I want to thank them. Art Khoury for his gracious and superb leadership. Many colleagues over the years, especially Buddy Ratner and Pat Staten, who is unfortunately unable to make it here today because of the storms on the East Coast and the lack of crew, of airplane crews out here on the West Coast. An interesting problem that I haven't uh, run into before. And I want to thank many excellent students over many years, and especially one named Wayne Gombitz, who's not here, but he's the one who put me together with Milton Harris and led me to uh, work more and more on PEG. And um, I also uh, want to thank <coughs> my loving family for their constant, strong, and lo loving support. And I have a bunch of family here, too, so I've... Uh, had breakfast with them. So I want to say uh, again, thank you for coming. And uh, let's go on. There's a picture of uh, Kemen Engineering News from 2014. And it's a cartoon replication of what we imagine to be a generic nanomedicine, essentially a pegylated polymeric micelle. And what you're looking at is, uh, actually it's a pegylated micelle. It, it's not a polymeric micelle per se, because it's made up of lipid bilayer, which is not polymeric. But basically what you're looking at is the size scale that we're dealing with is very small. Hundreds of nanometers at most. And um, then we're dealing also with this fuzzy beard around the outside called PEG. And that's the molecule, the, one of the most common molecules in, in the field of drug delivery and biomaterials. And normally when I'm at a meeting, I will flip to the back and I like to look through the index of paper titles to see you know, what is the focus in this meeting. They don't have it in this particular program, but I looked, uh, it's not there, but I'm always finding PEG as one of the most common topics at a meeting. It is the most commonly used polymer in the field of biomaterials and drug delivery. So here it is. The uh, title of the slide says the most common molecule used in drug delivery besides the drug, of course. And it's a water-soluble and water-binding polyether. And it loves uh, water. There's um, the oxygen, the ether oxygen is an electron donor, and it's a very um, uh, happy to bond, uh, hydrogen bond to water molecules, and there are estimates anywhere from two to four water molecules per uh, ether oxygen. So when this, we'll see, when this polymer increases in molecular weight and begins to form a statistically random coil, uh, it will lock up water molecules in that coil and act like a water-filled balloon. And that helps to protect drugs. It also helps to put whatever uh, cells it may be associated with and so on. So it's a very interesting protective molecule. And um, I would also like to say that the end group, the hydroxyl, there's two hydroxyls per peg molecule, the end group could also be a methoxy group, and that figures in the early history of PEG. The first person to discover PEG, or at least look for it and find it and want to use it, Frank Davis was his name, um, he was actually looking for MPEG, methoxy PEG, with an inert end, so he could use the other hydroxyl to attach to proteins. Interesting history. Well, there are a lot of uh, people in the audience. I would ask for a show of hands normally, but I have these uh, uh, spotlights on me and I wouldn't see much. But I will tell you that normally there are people working on pegylating drugs. 
and that is a big uh, and very profitable business. Um, there are also people interested in pegylating surfaces, diagnostic uh, assay people who want to run a, uh, an ELISA uh, on a surface that repels nonspecific protein binding, so PEG is used for that as well. And um, these two communities sometimes don't interact, so I want to bring them together in this talk and talk as if pegylating a surface is similar in principle and also in practice to um, pegylating drugs. So who, where did pegylation, where did the idea of pegylation come from? It's an interesting history. As I mentioned, Frank Davis is a biochemistry professor at Rutgers, and he actually was, as he said in the, and you'll see shortly in his little article, he was between grants. I mean, he was out of research money and looking for, he had, looking for ideas to uh, propose to the NIH, for example, and get funding for his research. And so um, he ran into this idea of protecting the new recombinant protein drugs. They were coming along in the late 60s and early 70s, and uh, that's what he wanted to do. And his former student and colleague, Abraham Abuchowski, uh, was influenced by him, of course, and he founded a company, uh, a pegylation company called Enzon. Now, I'm actually not sure why, um, Milton, uh, why uh, Frank Davis wasn't more involved in that company, but it may have been uh, that he was, he was restricted from doing it as a professor. And their objective was simply to pegylate, to attach PEG to the new recombinant protein drugs and then to sell them as, this is my car characterization, not theirs, as new and improved types of uh, pharmaceutical drugs. So this is an article uh, that you should all look for, look for two pages in the um, advanced drug delivery reviews. You see it at the top there. And uh, right up there is the, is the reference. And basically, I want to just quote a few pieces of uh, commentary here. And this is the very first paragraph. He says he was out of research funding. He was looking for a new idea. And he thought about making the new protein drugs less immunogenic because they're new to the body. And he thought if he attached a hydrophilic polymer of some sort, that could prevent the immune system from recognizing those uh, drugs, those protein drugs, as new and uh, therefore needing to be eliminated from the body. So they weren't uh, seen as foreign, is the point. So he selected PEG as the hydrophilic polymer that he was thinking could protect them from the immune, immune system recognition. And um, he actually was looking for, not PEG, he was looking for methoxy PEG so that he would have a, a dead end on one end and a, a react, reactive hydro, hydroxyl, which he would then attach to the protein drug. And uh, he found it. I think it was a union carbide chemical catalog, but I'm not sure. So there's a great video of Frank Davis in retirement talking about his discovery of PEG. You'll enjoy it. Don't worry if you can't copy this down right away. You just go and Google Frank Davis and um, um, pegylation, and you'll find it. So this is the article that he wrote with Ab Abraham Abuchowski, his student, who founded the company. Enzon, a pegylation, the first pegylation company. And uh, it was published in 1977, as you see, in uh, the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And the effect of covalent attachment of PEG on immunogenicity and cir circulating half-life of uh, the catalyst, uh, the catalase, the, the model protein they first studied. And, and this is uh, actually uh, published just before Abraham Abuchowski founded the company called Enzyme. Here's a picture of it at the grand opening in 1981. And um, he, I li list Frank Davis here as a scientific advisor because he was not directly associated with the company as an officer.
I think, oh, by the way, the guy in the middle there, that picture, he was probably the guy with the, with the bucks from the venture capital people. Um, that's always who cuts the ribbon. Um, so about that same time, I want to bring myself into the picture here a little bit. I was radiation grafting, using radiation to uh, chemically graft hydroxyethyl methacrylate. This is a monomer with one pendant ethylene glycol unit. I was totally unaware of this pegylation work and uh, everybody I was working with uh, and people that I was even related uh, to in research from before like Ed Merrill at MIT, none of us knew about pegylation from that article, we never saw it. So this is a mutual irradiation process. It's up, circled up on the left, and you put a polymer substrate, a surface you want to modify, in a monomer solution, and then irradiate in the absence of oxygen, and you get a grafted polymer on the surface. It's a process called, literally, as you say there, radiation grafting. And this is the polymer that we grafted, and you see the um, I just point out for, there are people in the audience who are, like I say, my relatives who are not familiar with the chemistry. So this is the polymer and it goes from the left to the right and continues repeating the same uh, unit many, many times, maybe a hundred times. And um, it's got one ethylene glycol unit. So what, he's, what we essentially produced by that grafting was a polymer that had ethylene glycols all along the backbone. And it turns out it did. It was really very good to resist protein adsorption. And this is the article. It's the first page of the article we published. I know you can't read it, but I will just uh, identify the fact what we were doing. There's the title of the article and the co-authors, Gottfried Schmer is a hematologist from the UW and uh, he worked with me on that and um, two students, uh, Harrison Kraft. And uh, this is what was in the table. Actually, our focus was on immobilizing biomolecules like heparin and uh, others. And uh, this is uh, interesting. We did, never thought about the idea of making it really a new biomaterial with a hydrophilic water wetting surface. We, we didn't really think hard about that. We, we knew about it, but of course. So grafting hydrophilic polymers onto hydrophobic biomaterials surfaces, and you see there are two polymers that could be grafted. The one on the left is what we did, and the one on the right is what, uh, in a uh, almost the same time period, uh, the Torei company in Japan was, were grafting that polymer on the right, which has a longer tail. Oops, sorry, uh, I forgot how to go back. So in, in, anyway, the, the CH2OH had multiple units, and uh, that gave it a longer and more hydrophilic, uh, thread-like, uh, like tree-like with branches along the side of PEG. And this is actually some of the, these are some of the data that they got on, in terms of platelet adhesion in vitro tests and uh, plasma protein adsorption. And what you see there is that at, as the length of that side chain increases, um, yeah, as it increases to around 50, which is a molecular weight of 2,000 roughly of a peg on the side as a side branch, they essentially re re reached a point where they re repelled all proteins and, and platelets. And this is, an, this is a first non-fouling surface, and it was a pegylated surface. So Torre was really the uh, first company to pegylate surfaces. There it is. And it, they were also the ones to highlight the importance of polymer peg molecular weight. And that's really key. So this was our con you know, conclusion of why it, why it worked. Um, surfaces with just a very thin layer of, uh, of a peg didn't really have the ability to resist protein adsorption, as you see here. But as the molecular weight of the peg increased, it bound the secondary water within the coil and acted like a water-filled balloon. That's the imagination. Of, we don't, it's not really a balloon per se, but 
It's what we imagine how it worked. And that was repelling um, uh, the uh, proteins that are trying to push it aside and bond to the surface like you see here. So it was essentially a surface that became very strongly hydrated by the peg and, with, and held strongly to its water. So when proteins adsorb on normal surfaces, they displace bound water from the surface. That's an entropy gain as the water leaves the surface. One molecule of protein displaces maybe 10 or 20 molecules of water. So it's an entropic gain, a huge entropic gain. It's not necessarily an energy phenomenon. It's an entropy phenomenon, phenomenon for sure. So that's what I say here. It was like a water-filled balloon. And here's a picture of, uh, from the uh, Torrey Company article in 1982. Well, they call it a, a PEO co code. You see the P, oops, um, actually, you, you, which one? Yeah, thank you. So we're essentially looking here at a surface that got to be very clean because it repelled the bonding of pr proteins and platelets. Um, it's not necessarily a biocompatible surface because it could form transient thrombi, emboli that come off the surface and go down and cause some, some kind of a blockage of coronary artery uh, vessels and so on. So it could, the a clean surface is not necessarily the best surface, but it's just an example of how cleanly it uh, was able to leave the surface. So Ed Merrill and Ed Saltzman also were working at that time, and Ed Merrill roundly publicized and talked about this uh, polyethylene oxide as a, uh, as he says here, cumulative evidence indicates a very low level of interaction between PEO and biologic species, cells and proteins, and this polymer is essentially an important biomaterial. So Ed Merrill is one of the um, supporters and promoters of, along with uh, Ed Saltzman here, of that, um, <clears throat> of the PEG ability to make a non-fouling surface. So I need to then go and talk about pegylated drugs. So that's what's happening today. We are pegylating drugs and the drug itself might be attack, uh, might be a substrate for an enzyme in the body. A uh, protein drug would certainly be that. And so we're trying to keep those kinds of challenges away from the drug and get it to its target site. So this has become a multi-billion dollar blockbuster pharmaceutical product. And this is a table, it's not, I'm sorry, I wish I had a uh, better table, but it, it is one. You look at the topic up, uh, title up there, pegylated products in clinical practice. And here are the conjugates of PEG with, with the drug, and here is the medical condition that is being treated. And uh, I just underline now in, in green the blockbuster pegylated drugs. This is what the, it says in the bottom, blockbuster is really like multi-million dollar sales. And um, there, it, it, with asterisks, you find essentially uh, PEG interferon and PEG, uh, granulocyte uh, colony forming uh, uh, protein, um, and that's the, other, the uh, Nulasta. So the two are called Pegasus and Nulasta, and they are blockbuster drugs. I don't know, I, I would normally in a small group ask if anybody knows somebody on one of those drugs, because they're the most common drugs used to treat those particular kinds of uh, problems, leukemia, and um, also uh, um, hepatitis. So this is a very interesting product. It's multi-billion, I think I have one slide, but I couldn't find it. it. Said it was $11 billion of sales in a few years ago, 2014. So that's giving you the magnitude of a, what's called a blockbuster drug. And here's a little about the um, conjugation of PEG to it. Uh, the PEG that's used is uh, based on a uh, uh, doubly conjugated PEG on a lysine, which is then attached through one of the amino groups to
to um, in in the in the pro uh, protein, which is the interferon there, and it makes a an active um, amide bond, or rather a passive amide bond. This is a strong bond, resisting hydrolysis, so it's a very good way to attach to this uh, protein. There's still a lot that's not known about pegylated proteins, drugs or whatever, um, and how much they may contribute to a, an immune response. But that's essentially, it's been used and successfully used and with big, big sales for years. There is a picture, however, of another question you might have. What if the peg goes to a million molecular weight isn't it going to block the active site of the drug? And yes, and this shows you uh, work of uh, Pascal by Bailan uh, from uh, uh, Anzon. It shows you the specific activity, the activity per, per unit mass of PEG uh, here as a function of the molecular weight of the PEG. And you see as it gets bigger and bigger, it, you essentially knock out the activity and you can imagine this peg is getting in the way of the active site of the drug. And uh, so that's uh, what's happening. So I think they settled on a molecular weight around um, between 10 and 20, somewhere in this region. Um, it's a compromise between protection in circulation and activity as a drug. So something recent, I'm getting to my last slides, we have discovered, uh, not we, but I mean, Steve Roffler was uh, one of the first, that there are antibodies to PEG. How can that be? PEG is the most inert looking molecule. It's, as I say here, the most innocent uh, polymer molecules that you could attach to a, uh, a drug. And it's forming antibodies. And that, this is a really a kind of surprising situation. And uh, I think, and here's an article, accelerated clearance of polyethylene glycol modified proteins by anti-PEG glycol IgM. Then this goes back to 1999. So this has been around for almost um, 20 years. And uh, you see, th this is a question now of what's happen what's going to happen to pegylated drugs. Well, people are looking more closely at it and they are seeing that pegylated drugs are actually being removed from circulation after two or three dose, doses. This is the man, Steve Roffler from, uh, 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 from Taiwan, who's made a career out of studying these antibodies, uh, both IgG and IgM antibodies to PEG. Well, how do you avoid how do you deal with the antibodies? Well, you try to avoid stimulating them. And here are some of the people who have been working to either replace PEG or to oppose the formation of antibodies. George Whitesides, actually uh, maybe 20 years ago, um, proposed um, self-assembled or surface-assembled uh, molecules and layers that resisted protein adsorption with zwitter ions. You see those over here in this group of three. Uh, those two, rather, are zwitter ions. This is a group of molecules that are similarly bound to surfaces and form uh, monolayers that are neutral, but they don't have H bond donors. That was another proposal of Whitesides. So zwitter ions is an interesting proposal. And uh, Professor Kazuhiko Ishihara, who is here today, I'm glad to, to see this slide. Uh, he's been saying for years that his Zwitter ion, which is uh, made from a uh, uh, lipid uh, mimic uh, of the lipid bilayer uh, in a cell, um, his, his uh, polymer, which polymerizes through the bond, the double bond there, is a very, very in, in, sort of innocent an inert molecule. And so this is a zwitter ion, and it's also this family of polymers that are being developed to replace PEG, and I put that in quotes because I don't think it's gonna happen. And here's another one, a polycarboxybetaine methacrylate. So this is the backbone of the polymer up here, and there's your zwitter ion here 
of the cation and anion on the pendant group. And here's uh, some work of uh, Xiao Yu Zhang in our department. And uh, you see there, these are essentially uh, anti, uh, anti, um, in IgM and IgG forma uh, formation or stimulation by um, either carboxybutane gold nanoparticles or pegylated gold nanoparticles. And you can see that PEG in both of these uh, examples, this is um, IgG and IgM over here, PEG is really stimulating more of these uh, antibodies than PCB, polycarboxybutane. So the zwitterions are looking very interesting as a family of molecules to essentially resist the formation of antibodies in the uh, use of pegylated drugs. And that's what I see here. A few slides left just to show you other compositions that are looking interesting as possible replacements for PEG. And here is um, a good old friend, Milton Harris, who is a very well-known guy in the, in the PEG business. He actually formed a company called uh, Shearwater, which was purchased by Nectar Therapeutics. And um, th th that company was a very strong promoter of pegylated drugs. Now they're looking at new compositions. And uh, I think that this is a good statement. Greater than $120 billion of cumulative product sales can be attributed to the old fashioned pegylated drug technology that he and his partner, uh, Mike Bentley, some superb chemists uh, who essentially uh, made a lot of money on that in that field. So here's what he's working on now. It's a polyoxazoline, it's a water soluble, very benign polymer. And uh, th there you see the structure. Uh, Jean Frechet was at a meeting I was at in uh, Tokyo um, celebrating Kataoka, uh, Kazunori Kataoka's retirement. And here's the list that he showed in his talk about two carriers that might replace PEG. And, and you see the first one is a hydroxypropyl meth acrylamide, and the other one, N-vinyl pyrrolidone here. Those are very well-known simple polymers, and uh, they're also very hydrophilic, like PEG, and very water-soluble, like PEG, and, uh, and so on. So let me just continue to the next slide. And this is a uh, Heather Maynard's uh, wheel of uh, biocompatible uh, uh, polymers that could potentially replace PEG. And they're in three categories, biodegradable, non-biodegradable, and branched and comb. And you'll see some of the uh, titles there is Witterions. Well, it's not, there it is, polyoxazoline, PEGMA, and so on. So I'm gonna stop here and just tell you that the future is wide open for PEG and pegylated drugs, and I think they're going to stay around for a long time. I think if the FDA did anything to, to essentially reject their use in any way, it would be earth-shaking to the industry. So I think pegylated drugs are here to stay. It's an optimistic, but I think a happy conclusion, even though we see these problems coming up. Thank you very much.